here today to share with us uh, some information about diagnosing lawn problems. And since we're already eight minutes in, Sam, go ahead and take it away. Sure. Yeah, sounds good. So uh, thanks for the introduction there, Andrea. Sorry about the technical difficulties here. Uh, I think we should be all set to go. Um, so the topic I want to discuss here uh, this afternoon is diagnosing lawn problems. I've received quite a few questions uh, this year about how to actually, you know, what is the process that I use to go about trying to identify what the specific issue is that one of your uh, customers or clients or, you know, a property owner might be dealing with in their lawn or landscape. So uh, I have a lot of information to get through here. I think we'll just leave uh, questions till the end and we're just going to dive into it then. So basic uh, overview of the session that we're going to go through here. Uh, first, I want to talk about some common problems that we see in lawns and really separate these problems up into either the abiotic problems, which would be uh, non-living type of stresses like salt damage on boulevards or flooding type of damage, uh, and then also the biotic problems, so, so, so those living uh, plant stresses that we see. Uh, you know, what I have in my tool bag that I use to help try to diagnose some issues. And then also I have several uh, checklists here that I'm going to share with you that you can use when you go visit uh, a homeowner uh, to try to diagnose some issue that they're experiencing in their lawn. Then finally, we're going uh, to uh, wrap everything up with the uh, seven-step uh, process uh, to diagnosing lawn care issues. And this is the process that I go through. You know, when the issue in the lawn is not clearly obvious uh, of what it might be. <clears throat> so common problems in lawn. So uh, just a basic, you know, high level overview here of lawn problems. We mentioned so abiotic and biotic stresses. The abiotic, again, are those non-living plant issues that we see. This pet urine is a, a question quite often uh, is an abiotic type of stress. And one of the key indicators here um, that lets me know this is uh, actually a pet urine damaged area it is uh, the reason these spots die from the pet urine is because of the high nitrogen and the high salt in their urine. So with the nitrogen, we see this bright green ring usually uh, around these dog urine spots. And actually, in some cases, uh, nitrogen is, is not enough to, to kill the grass, and we actually have just a bright green, uh, dark green uh, pet that we see from that urine. Now we can separate that from some of our biotic or living uh, plant issues. Uh, this is just a fungus below here. Take all patch is what this, this fungus is. So we see in this case, we don't have a green ring around this patch type of disease. And actually we can see we have necrosis or chloride plant tissue on the outermost edge uh, of this ring, which tells us that this disease is actually progressing and seeing some recovery in the center of this patch where the, uh, the pathogen has moved out from. Uh, abiotic type of issues can really be separated up into uh, two main categories. So we have environmental uh, issues that can be abiotic, and then we also have management-related issues as well. So from, from an environmental standpoint, um, you know, the three main categories that I think about are different microclimates that we might have in lawns and whether that's a shaded type of situation um, or you know different slopes or topography changes. We also have these uh, heat sinks which are quite uh, frequent in uh, urban type of areas and by heat sink I mean you know some area that's adjacent to a boulevard you know some type of impervious surface uh, or some you know south facing slope as well. Those are key indicators you know, we may be dealing with some type of heat-related stress stress on our cool season grasses. We also have soil problems, which are abiotic type of stresses, whether it's nutrient deficiencies, uh, impaction type issues, and moisture stress issues uh, as well. And uh, extremes, and, and really we're looking at weather-based extremes here. So uh, temperature extremes, high and low temperatures. A flood type of damage. Certainly, we saw quite a bit of this in June of uh, 2014, uh, possibly a little bit in, in, in May of this year. And drought damage, which we saw very extensively in the fall of 2012 as well. Management uh, issues that are, you know, that can be abiotic stresses. So, uh, main categories here: chemical damage and also mechanical injury. So, chemical damage would be this pet urine one that we talked about. 
We also see uh, quite often herbicide damage, uh, you know, depending on what type of herbicide is actually applied, but if it was applied at the wrong timing or the incorrect rate or wrong species of grass, we can actually see quite a bit of damage from herbicide injury. And oftentimes that can be misdiagnosed as some type of disease issue that we might have in the lawn. But uh, anyway, definitely something I see quite often. And then certainly we also have fuel uh, or oil spills that can be chemical type of damage. Mechanical injury, uh, definitely, you know, related to any type of use that we have uh, on, so scalping, which is a mowing type of issue. We certainly have plenty of, of mowing issues that we see, causing abiotic stresses, uh, excessive wear from traffic or, uh, uh, you know, from people running or from vehicular traffic. And so uh, in, in Minnesota, we see quite a bit of snowplow damage as well on the sides of roads and on some of our uh, driveways also, uh, the type of mechanical injury there. Overview of the biotic issues that we see in lawns. So uh, these can also be separated up into two main categories. So we have, you know, what we call just our general lawn pests, and then we'll ha also have pathogens uh, as well. So our general pests could be things from insects to animals or moths and algae. Uh, in the category of insects, we have both surface feeding insects which would be, in a lot of cases, something like a sod webworm, uh, you know, some type of worm generally, or a chinch bug even would be a surface feeding type of insect. We have sub subsurface feeding insects. The white grubs are the main ones that we're thinking about with that. We're going to talk a little bit more about uh, the white grub issues that we see in lawns. Uh, so, uh, you know, we have damage from, from many of our vertebrates. So moles, voles, and gophers can cause issues with lawns. Uh, and then also uh, in you know, shaded, wet type of situations. A lot of cases we can see uh, moss, uh, and, and we also see some algae in, in thin lawns, and then black layer can also be uh, another issue that we see in the soils, uh, which, which is a type of biotic stress. Pathogens that we see, fungi was probably the main uh, pathogen that we're going to be dealing with, so we can have uh, those pathogens that affect the the foliage uh, of the plants only. We can have pathogens that affect both the roots and the foliage. And then also we have uh, root only pathogens. Uh, pathogens separated up into to categories of bacteria, virus, you know, which really we don't see that much in issues with these in lawns. We did have some type of uh, bacteria and virus issues in the past, but usually uh, those issues can be overcome through plant breeding and breeding for resistance uh, of some of these, these type of diseases there. Nematodes, which are microscopic worms, essentially, that live in the soil and also be injurious to, uh, to our lawn grasses. Uh, not an issue that we deal with quite often, but uh, if you've exhausted all of your, your risks and your resources and really can't come up with an answer, uh, sometimes the nematode test uh, may be in order if the turf is really just looking fairly weak. Okay, so our abiotic problems are certainly often misdiagnosed as, as plant diseases. You know, people see a patch in the lawn and, and, the, and they see it spreading or they see it multiplying. And, and a lot of times it, uh, a disease is kind of the first thing that comes to people's mind. But I, I'll say I see quite a few more issues with a, abiotic problems than do with biotic problems. Uh, abiotic problems, they can occur certainly uh, suddenly or uh, over a period of time as well. It just depends on what particular issue uh, that, that we're seeing is. You know, heat stress is something that can develop over time and some of the other type of damage like uh, mower stress or, um, or urine damage can occur almost suddenly. Uh, typically, our abiotic problems are going to have distinct patterns of damage. So really, uh, when you go in and look for some type of issue, if it is any distinct pattern to that damage, in most cases, it will be an abiotic type of stress. Uh, a couple of ones that, a couple of good ones that come to my mind would be salt damage on boulevards. We can see uh, a progressively more dead turf as we get closer to that to that boulevard. Uh, the turf damage reduces as we get further away from that boulevard. A localized compaction stress as well would be a typical pattern where people constantly walk or uh, maybe we even have pet, uh, you know, uh, routes pets travel quite frequently. Uh, great lines of damage from equipment. Mowing uh, is certainly a cause of this in many cases. If we have uh, 
type of spray damage, oftentimes you will see uh, you know, straight lines from that particular herbicide that was sprayed and from the application process. And also for irrigation performance, something certainly to look for um, when we're looking for abiotic stresses in lawn. There almost always will be some type of pattern associated with that poor uh, performance of your irrigation system. Just a couple of pictures here of some of the abiotic stresses that I see, you know, around quite frequently in Minnesota here. So this is that salt damage along the boulevard that I was referring to here. Um, you know, pretty uh, pretty dead giveaway of, of what the issue is. And we can see uh, how uh, much the issue progresses as we get closer to the, to the, uh, the road there. Uh, this is just the traffic damage from, from pets uh, around that area of the house. So pretty easy issue to solve there. This is obviously uh, that those those patterns that I was talking about here with a mower type of damage, and they had some mower uh, blade that was out of adjustment in this case. And, uh, you know, we don't need to follow the seven-step uh, diagnostic process for any of these ones that we just showed here. It's pretty obvious of what the issue is. Track damage that we see uh, quite often on uh, fine fescues in the middle of the summer. Uh, we can see uh, injury due to uh, to traffic in, in high heat situations uh, that I'm showing there. Uh, rough bluegrass, uh, which is the Latin name of this poet trivia here. This is a plot out at the uh, at, at the Landscape Arboretum. Uh, this is one species that particularly suffers from heat stress and sun stress uh, when it's out in open environments. So uh, usually, if if you have any type of, of rough bluegrass in your lawn you will see this in July and August, and then usually growth would resume uh, fall of the year. Obviously, the, the, the mower damage, this is a photo from Bob Mugis here. Um, we can see the shredded leaf tips are uh, really an issue that we deal with with dull mowers and uh, mowers that aren't operating uh, as they're supposed to be. And, and certainly, we need to focus on uh, shower blades, and obviously, that will improve the overall appearance of our turf and its resistance to some of these uh, both abiotic and biotic type of stresses. Just some good pictures of abiotic stresses there uh, that I see quite often. Now, our biotic problems, so we can, uh, the infect infectious agents of turf grass can be separated up into four major categories here. Uh, fungi, there are approximately 60 different fungi that might affect. In Holland, in Minnesota, we probably see about 10, I suppose, uh, but it really depends on the time of year when we would be seeing seeing that we probably only see four or five at specific times of year. Viruses, there are 22 that could affect turf, not really much of an issue that we see uh, in Minnesota on our cool season grasses, but just certainly worth noting. Nematodes, there are eight uh, that can, uh, can negatively affect turf. Here's a picture on the right-hand side here of what a microscopic nematode that, uh, that ringworm uh, looks like there. And then bacteria, we have two that affect turf. Now, some common fungi that I see in lawns, this is certainly not an, an all-inclusive list here, but these are probably some of the more common uh, issues that I see. Leaf spots are certainly around throughout all times of the year. Rust disease, we're going to look a little bit more at that. Um, red pet is another issue that we see primarily in the spring and the fall. Now, rust, uh, red thread, and then dollar spot here. Dollar spot uh, usually starts to occur in small little, little spots. I'll show a picture of that. Um, these these main uh, three here are usually indicators of low nitrogen in your lawn environment. So knowing which diseases are prevalent in some of these different uh, different situations certainly can be very important. Nitrogen would be the main one we look at to determine uh, try to determine what might actually be causing this disease type issue. And then the chronic ring spot as well. We're going to dive uh, talk a little bit more about that particular disease there. Okay, here's just a close-up picture of red thread. This is a really extreme example of uh, thread affecting uh, Kentucky bluegrass turf, uh, I believe, in this case here. So uh, red thread, as I mentioned, is a low nitrogen disease, and usually recommendations would be to get a nice fertilizer application down, and when the temperatures uh, warm up a little bit, your turf should generally grow out of it. But uh, the, the red thread here would be what we call a sign of the pathogen actually being present there. So that's kind of a dead giveaway of what the issue is here uh, in this case. And we're going to talk a little bit more about how to identify uh, signs of some of these type of pathogens. 
lawn problems, uh, you know, just continuing here. So uh, certainly we see common uh, lawn insects. Uh, white grubs are, you know, one of the main insects that we deal with. Here's just a picture uh, of a white grub that was affecting uh, a home lawn that I saw here this spring. Sod webworm and, and bluegrass billbug are both surface feeding uh, type of insects along with the chinch bug as well. We can see these at different times of the year. The sod webworm is usually going to have two to three generations uh, per year, and we're going to talk about a test that you can do to try to determine if you, in fact, have sod webworm affecting some lawns. Uh, chinch bugs can certainly be an issue with some of our grasses as well. And then it's a kind of a nuisance pest uh, that we deal with in lawns. Animal pests, certainly uh, moles, voles uh, as well. Voles are like a small field mouse. And usually we see vole damage when the snow uh, melts in the spring. In a lot of cases, uh, the areas that hold snow the longest will have the most damage from voles. So the bottom right picture here is a picture of, uh, you know, some, some vole damage here on campus. And, and we really see this uh, every year from, from that nuisance type of pest or a, a, a damaging type of pests. Skunks, raccoons, and gophers can certainly cause issues in our lawns as well. So this is a home lawn. This is uh, in Andover, where a gentleman had called me up because uh, he was experiencing some severe thinning of his turf and wondering, you know, and he, and wondering what he could do uh, to try to uh, improve the quality of his lawn. He wasn't on a very good fertility program. He had an irrigation system, and in this case, it was Kentucky bluegrass. You know, the first thing I noted when I went to this site was he, he does have a pet. The, the dog urine spots here and how much those areas are actually greening up quite a bit from that dog urine, and it's actually not killing the grass. So, you know, the first thing that that kind of said to me is, um, you know, possibly this, this thin area could be a nutrient type of deficiency, especially due to the fact that these, uh, these areas are greening up quite a bit here from the nitrogen that dog urine. I had a little bit of time and uh, poking around the property and, and trying to see if he had more issues. I did not see any lesions on the grass at all. I did not see any distinctive type of pattern. You know, and finally, after about 10 or 15 minutes, I suppose, I started tugging at the grass a little bit. And what I found when I started tugging at the grass was uh, these white grubs. So the grass would literally, and this is Kentucky bluegrass in this case, you could really pull up the grass almost like it was just sodded yesterday because of the damage that these white grubs were, were doing here. So, um, you know, usually we would say the threshold for, for white grubs might be three or four white grubs per square foot. Uh, it really depends on what the species of grubs that you have. Some grubs can be quite a bit bigger than others. In this case, we can, we can count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight grubs in this little uh, square foot area. So, and, and you can see uh, on the underside of the, the turf that pulled up here, uh, there's actually no roots on the turf at all. So, uh, you know, this was a situation where I identified these grubs as being the main issue that he was experiencing. Um, and, and really it was related to the soil type that he had. He had more of a sandy type of soil and grubs really liked it. And it was different from his neighbors. They were really able to move around quite freely. But uh, unless I would have were to pull on that turf, I, I really would have never uh, been able to diagnose this issue as being a white grub issue. So in this case, I identified the grubs as being both um, June beetle grubs and then also Japanese beetle grubs. So depending on what type of grubs you have, um, you, your control strategies might change a little bit. The, the issue with the May and June beetle grubs is they have one generation every three years. So at any one time in your lawn, you can have multiple generations of these May June beetle grubs, and they can be very difficult to control because of their different stages of growth when you're trying to control them. Japanese beetle grubs have just one generation per year, and controls are, are more effectively able to target when the when the larvae are are uh, becoming present. So uh, anyway, that's just an issue that I saw with the white grubs in this person's property there. So uh, just continuing on biotic problems here, uh, moss, algae, you know, uh, really don't need any investigative work to try to figure out the issues that, because they're, you know, fairly prevalent when we have them. Both the algae are encouraged by wet conditions and compaction. So usually the recommendations in this case would be to try to reduce the soil moisture, leave compaction. The moss is going to be more severe in shaded situations. 
all infertile and acidic soils. We're going to see more issues with moss. Uh, algaes are going to be more severe in, uh, I'm sorry, in, in full sun, it should say there, it's a typo. Oops. It was here. Uh, algae is more severe in, excuse me, full sun situations and fertile. So that's the difference between moss and algae there. Sorry about that typo. Okay, so tool bags and checklists. I'll just go through what I have in my tool bag and some of these checklists that we use here. So uh, my tool bag looks kind of, you know, something like this. Uh, soil probes are really the most important thing that I bring with me every time. Uh, this one on the far right here is a soil profiler. So you're able to stick that in the ground and it gives you a really flat view of the soil. And this thing opens up so you can really get a good snapshot of what the soil uh, layers look like and even any difference between soil types on a particular property. I have just a large and small soil probe here as well. Uh, hand lens is certainly valuable to you to bring along. I like to bring along this macroscope here. It can be, you know, particularly useful for trying to identify any type of turf disease uh, that you might be seeing. Uh, I like to bring bags for any sampling, whether you're going to conduct a soil test or you're going to bring uh, these plants back with you and maybe even submit them to a laboratory or look at some weed species for further identification. Bags are certainly very, very important to have. Quick reference materials, so you know, just a, maybe a, a broadleaf uh, weed identification book and a grassy weed identification book. Little pocket sized ones uh, can certainly be good to go in your uh, tool bag there. I have a moisture meter here as well. I usually I use that more so for golf courses than I do for home lawns, uh, but that can be a pretty uh, valuable tool here uh, if, if skills of, of determining moisture are not very good. good. I uh, just the feel method, so uh, I do like that soil moisture meter. And uh, I also have, you can see here, this height of the cut gauge, which is this red one in the middle. Uh, so this you stick into the ground, and you can determine uh, there are little measurements here to determine what the height of cut of the lawn actually is. And, you know, some of the weed issues, or insect issues, or even disease issues that we deal with might specifically be related to the height of cut that their grass is at. So knowing that can be. Uh, very helpful. This is just a turf check too, is what it's called here. And then I'm never spraying anything or uh, or trying to determine any type of weather conditions. Usually I'll bring along this anemometer here. So this has the wind, the relative humidity, uh, temperature measurements as well. Uh, this little handheld device. It's my tool bag, and you all, all might have something, uh, some other beneficial tools here as well. But these are just pretty much the basics that I carry along with me. Uh, to try to diagnose any type of issue. Now, we also have uh, a pre visit questionnaire. I email to anybody who is looking to have uh, a, a lawn care issue assessed. And this is actually a three page questionnaire, so uh, they need to fill it out as best as they can. And we have provided it for you here. The link is on top of this PowerPoint here. And I believe Andrea has also posted this link uh, to, to this webinar, which you can print off. And uh, even email off to, to somebody who's looking to try to solve an issue uh, should be in the chat box there. This is going to be filled out before you actually visit the property by the property owner or the manager. The reason for using this pre-questionnaire is really provides a good background for you uh, prior to your visit. and Maybe it will even indicate whether you need to uh, do a little research before you visit the property as well. And these are also very beneficial to uh, to avoid what I, you know, I'd call unnecessary site visits. So uh, property owners that actually sit down and take the time to go through this three-page document to fill it out are really showing you some initiative that they obviously have a vested interest in solving the issue that they're dealing with. They're not just looking for a free site visit uh, uh, from you. So I think you know whether they actually take the time to fill this out can, uh, you know, can be important to determine whether or not you should actually be visiting that property. This is also meant to save you time in solving the problem. So um, the that I have is, is pretty extensive. I use it for both uh, professional turf and for home lawns. You know, they don't need to fill out every single question. If they don't know the answer to it, it's not, not really big of a deal. But any, any specific information they can provide on here will certainly uh, help in the long run to that, try to determine what their issue is that they're experiencing. We have this that can be filled out uh, by you on site. This is actually one here 
that was provided to me from Dr. Aaron Patton at Purdue University. This is a two-pager here. The link is also posted in the chat box and it's up on top of the PowerPoint here. So it's filled out by you on site as you're assessing as you're assessing the site, as you're talking with the property owner, you may require some reference materials to, to help accurately identify what pests or what uh, weeds or insects they're experiencing on their site there. Uh, these forms have, have blank spaces to fill out all the types of information. So everything from the turf information, which would be, you know, the height of cut, the frequency of mowing, the uh, we have the, the, the species of grass as well. Any weeds, diseases, or insects that you're seeing. Uh, you also include soil information on there, uh, whether or not you want to do a soil test and what the results from that soil test actually are. Um, uh, microclimates, weather conditions, irritant and mowing, anything that they can conduct uh, to their property can help you uh, determine what issues they're actually experiencing. Materials that I use. So these are just three, uh, three good. You know what I feel are really good books. They're all paperbacks. So you, you know, fit nicely in your bag. Um, the Compendium of Turf Grass Diseases is one that I use quite often. And this in the back of it has a key to try to help you identify what disease you might be experiencing. I use that uh, quite a bit. The diseases are, uh, are organized by temperatures they'll be occurring at, and then. Uh, the next part of the key deals with what the pattern of that disease actually looks like. So I've used that quite often. Uh, Handbook of Turfgrass Insect Pests, another uh, good paperback copy. Uh, if you try to determine what insect issues you might be experiencing. And then of the North Central States is also another good publication to try to uh, determine uh, what some unknown uh, weed might actually be. Good uh, drawings in that book there as well. Finally, we're getting into the seven-step uh, diagnosis process here. I'll try to move a little bit quickly uh, through this so we have time for questions as well. The uh, so first step that I always try to do is identify the host. And by the host, I mean, you know, grass species is actually affected in, in the lawn. Any of the diseases that we experience in lawns can affect, you know, only, you know, one or two types of grass species, and they may not affect another. So the picture that I have on the right-hand side here, this is just our research center. What we have on the, on the left side uh, of this picture is all fine fescue, and that's really uh, be damaged here in this case by a disease we call summer pest. On the right side, we have creeping bank grass, and you can see that the disease uh, has not encroached into the creeping bank grass at all. So uh, certainly determining what uh, species you're dealing with is the first step to, to what issue you might be experiencing. And then also uh, weedy grasses are often misdiagnosed as turf grass diseases. Oftentimes, uh, creeping bent grass and even the rough bluegrass will form patches in lawns, and they're going to look different at, at different times of the year. Uh, so being able to identify, you know, what that they're actually different grasses and not diseases uh, can be very important to help try to solve uh, some type of issue that they're experiencing. Uh, we use several different structures for identifying grasses. We have another link here for you as well. So this is a, a tool from Purdue University that helps with identifying turf grasses. You can go in and select, you know, the different characteristics of the grass that you're trying to identify, and it will hopefully uh, lead you to the correct identification of that grass. But we have uh, several different, you know, types of, I guess, what I would call appendages uh, for determining, uh, for distinguishing different species from, you know, one another. Uh, leaf tip is one main one that we look at. So uh, Kentucky bluegrass and actually all of your bluegrasses, annual bluegrass and, and uh, even you know, pine of bluegrass or rough bluegrass will have this bow shaped type of leaf tip. So when you run your finger over the leaf tip, it should split, kind of, uh, if everyone thinks of a, what a snake's tongue would like, uh, what the boat shaped leaf tip would look like. And then we have pointed leaf tips as well. Uh, and almost other species other than bluegrass will have uh, some type of, of pointed leaf tip. Perennial ryegrass, tall fescue, the fine fescues all have, have pointed leaf tip. So and, and in most cases, if you do have a boat-shaped leaf tip, you're going to be dealing with a uh, type of bluegrass. In many cases, it would be Kentucky bluegrass. But then we also look at, so how, how those are actually situated in that stem. Are they rolled or folded in that stem? Will help us to differentiate the two. Ligule, which is just an appendage, uh, kind of at the collar, uh, the base of the stem and the leaf blade, uh, some grasses can have uh, 
ligules than others, and some don't have any ligules at all, so that can help. Oracle, I'm going to show you a picture of what an Oracle look like, looks like here. And if you can let some of these, you know, if all else fails, uh, you know, an issue and we don't see any seed heads because of that mowing practice. So if you can let some of these species you identify actually go to seed, um, it might be easier to identify uh, the grass based on what those seed heads actually look like. You can grow them out if you're really being stumped by that particular uh, grassy weed. Uh, here's an example of an oracle. So we have two grasses that have what we would call these claw-like or cusping oracles. This is annual ryegrass, um, which we find in a lot of our quick repair mixtures. The one in this case here actually is quack grass. So uh, you can see that there, these appendages, these oracles, are these appendages that wrap around uh, from the leaf and the collar region here, wrap around the stem of the grass plant. And that would be a dead giveaway uh, that you're dealing with either quack grass or annual ryegrass. Um, annual ryegrass is is an anti so not much to worry about there. The quack grass is a perennial cool season grass and can be very difficult to control on an existing cool season lawn. So this is the dead giveaway for quack there. You really won't see clasping oracles on any of our other grass, uh, weedy grass species types. Step two after you identify the species you're dealing with is try to identify what the symptoms are that you're experiencing. So the symptom is is the, basically the visible expression of plant's reaction to that particular um, to the problem. So we can classify these as either stand-based symptoms, which would be you know symptoms across the, an entire stand or an entire lawn, or individual plant type symptoms. When we get down and actually look closely at the leaf blades, we can see what the symptoms would look like on individual leaf blades or on the crown or even on the roots of the grasses. Uh, diseases, uh, insects, and abiotic issues will generally have some specific type of issue, uh, some specific type of symptom associated with that damage. Now, in a lot of cases, you're going to be looking for spots. Um, we'll look at what, what some spots might look like. Patches, circles, or rings can uh, help you eliminate uh, some other type of diseases that do not form these type of distinct uh, symptoms. We have irregular shapes as well. We see the irregular shapes with a lot of our snow mold, grapes, speckles type of snow molds. And then if we have any type of pattern, in that cases, there's going to be some type of mowing or ishin stress. Uh, in some cases, you may be actually spreading a pathogen on a piece of equipment, so it, it can be very useful to try to uh, identify what pathogen that might be, um, but still the pattern could be a good giveaway on that. Just some examples of stand symptoms here. So symptoms that, again, are evident from a distance. Spots are generally going to be less than four inches in diameter. Uh, if you're looking at any reference materials, patches are irregularly shaped areas uh, that are greater than four inches in diameter. Circles would be obviously perfe uh, perfectly circular areas uh, than four inches in diameter. Ring would be uh, a, a of healthy turf is surrounded by a, a ring of uh, infected turf, like that take-all take patch that we looked at there previously. And then killer, uh, obviously, uh, symptoms will have no type of pattern associated with that. Uh, plant symptoms, so symptoms that are evident on individual plants. Uh, we can have many different types here. So leaf spots, either round or oval areas with distinct borders on those. A foliar type of lesions would, instead of being a spot, uh, it would be actually an irregular type of area with a distinct border on leaf blade. We can also have stem lesions as well. Full light or dieback or necrosis uh, it can certainly occur on, on leaves or entire tillers, and that might be specific to a, a particular disease that, that you're experiencing. Crown, so same thing, necrosis of crowns, uh, roots or stolons, and then say root rot as well can be another type of uh, plant symptom that we experience. Grass. Uh, just uh, you know, uh, picture examples of the difference between a stand symptom. In this case, we have dollar spot sclerotinia homeocarpa is pathogen there, and these are uh, spots that are less than four inches in diameter associated with that particular disease. And here are the plant symptoms of this dollar spot. If you were to get down really closely and actually look at that turf, uh, you can see a lot of times from a dollar spot standpoint. 
these lesions are be considered an hourglass type of lesion on our, on our leaf blade. So very, very common with uh, the pathogen dollar spot. Here now we're, we're going to be, uh, you know, getting away from symptoms and looking for actual signs of a particular pathogen for its product. And a lot of these signs, uh, you know, are going to be evidence of that pathogen itself. So mycelium is some we see quite often uh, associated with dollar spot or pythium is another disease. We see mycelium in the morning generally, which is a web-like uh, mass of fungal growth. We see spore masses on occasion from, um, you know, uh, some type of smuts or uh, uh, um, disease like that. Generally, it's a fuzzy or gelatinous uh, growth on our turf grasses. Fruities we can see as well, so spore, those are spore-producing structures. Sclerotia, often associated with our, our snow molds that we see. These are uh, very small, round. Uh, they can be thread-like structures as well. In the case with red thread, um, those would be uh, signs that the pathogen itself is actually present. Much there are obviously uh, signs of uh, uh, structures being produced by a fairy ring fungus. And then we, and we also identify insect signs by identifying that particular insect uh, site. Uh, here's an example of a sign that you might see of a particular pathogen in a home law. And this is rust, which is uh, Puccinia species. Um, and we can see that the rust, these are rust pustules or uridi, uh, uridinial spores. Uh, so that's a sign that the, actually the pathogen is present. Once we determine that rust is the issue here, uh, we can make recommendations of actually trying to get some of that rust going forward. Here's a, a micro of what those pustules look like, these reproducing structures, when they're coming out of a, of a leaf blade here. So this is the cross-section of the blade, and we can see those rust pustules actually coming out of that leaf blade there. That's a pathogen sign. If you're looking for some type of insect issue, I'll say, you know, sod webworm is probably one that we deal with, uh, you know, the most in, in uh, you know, at surface feeding insects go. Um, you can use a soil type of flush to inspect for sod webworm. So you can see a gentleman with a watering can here. He has a soap and water mixture. What he's doing is pouring that mixture on the turf. Usually, a, you know, you might pick a square foot or a couple square foot area. You get a, a couple minutes, and, and if you do have presence of any type of worm in that situation, cutworm, sod webworm, arm worm might be another issue you see. Uh, those worms should come to the surface because they do not like that soap solution. So uh, just a couple examples of what some of these worms might look like. Here's a mixture for that, uh, or the recipe for that soap solution uh, process. So you're gonna mix one to two fluid ounces of joy. You can use uh, lemon joy, seems to work the best, or even lemon, you know, some sort of lemon dishwashing detergent. You're gonna mix that with two gallons of water in a watering can or a bucket. Then you're gonna pour or sprinkle that solution over uh, one square yard or square foot of turf. And observe, you know, for five to ten minutes, uh, if you have worms present, those the worm larvae uh, will certainly come to the uh, surface. Oftentimes, I like to, to do this test in the morning. A lot of our worms, like the sod webworm, actually feed at night. Uh, probably not, you're going to have a hard time finding them at night, but they still may be a little bit active in the early morning, or at least they'll be very close to the surface there in the early morning is when I like to conduct the uh, process there. Step four, inspect the site and ask questions. So this is checklist time. You know, this is when you're going through and filling out that checklist and making sure you're, you're, uh, you're covering everything and asking all of the right questions. The checklist is gonna include recent history of lawn care practices, uh, which are certainly gonna be, you know, some type of applications. When did they apply fertilizer last? What kind of fertilizer was it? Did it have slow release nitrogen source in it at all? Um, have any pesticides been applied recently? What's their irrigation program? Do they apply any irrigation at all? Um, have they conducted any seeding? Uh, what are their cultural practices? When did they aerate? Uh, for their mowing practices? Recent weather patterns, certainly something to take note of here as well. And then also, I like to try to establish a timeline of when it occurred. Uh, was it there last year? Has it been continually growing in size here? When did it initially start? Uh, has, it, has it been decreasing in size? Uh, as well, so all can help uh, lead you to identification. Try to find some of your microclimates. 
And then are multiple graph species uh, affected? Be sure to take note of that uh, as well. Step evaluate the soil physical characteristics. So this is where you're getting the soil probe or the soil profiler out. You're trying to determine, you know, is a very heavy soil is a sandy soil. You know, just roughly, uh, if you can determine that soil type based on some type of ribbon test. If you have a ribbon uh, that you're forming in your hand, and as you, you know, get moisture in the soil, and as you put that soil out between your index finger and your thumb, you form some type of ribbon. If you have a ribbon that's less than one inch, uh, generally it'd be a sand or a long type of soil. A ribbon between one to two inches usually indicates a little bit more clay. Uh, example would be a silty clay type of loam. If you have a ribbon that forms that's greater than two inches, in most cases this will be some type of clay soil. As an example, would be a silty, you know, silty clay type of soil there. Try to assess the level of compaction as well by using your soil probe there. Uh, what's the moisture status of the lawn? Uh, soil type consistent throughout the property. Is the particular issue they're experiencing simply on, uh, you know, simply confined to one different soil type that maybe was changed out in the past? I've seen that quite often. And they recently conducted a soil test. If not, you certainly might want to consider doing that. Uh, in, in the near future in your situation. Six, so synthesize that information, try to uh, break it all down, review the checklist, review the notes that you've made, consult your reference materials as well. Try to identify what the potential causes might be at this point in time. If you really can't get there, you know, definitely you have the option to try to converse with some colleagues or myself and to solve that issue. I converse with colleagues quite often to try to solve lawn care issues. In fact, the picture on the right-hand side here, this is an issue that I saw in, in three lawns here this year. The first time I saw it, um, it really threw me for a loop. And I, I knew that, you know, definitely the green spots in this lawn, I and mean, this is really dramatic here, but definitely green spots in this lawn were associated with nitrogen. Uh, I, you know, wasn't overly aware that, matter of fact, that's how they fertilize trees in uh, a lot of cases. So... Uh, they've set out a grid pattern here, and they're augering a hole, and they're dropping some type of tree fertilizer spike in this lawn. And with a lawn like this, where it was really lacking nitrogen and fertility, we had a lot of that fertility actually released in these tree spikes. So it was meant to be fertilizing this tree here on the bottom right-hand side, and I assume the like a birch tree there on the top left. Um, so this is due to tree fertilization. I saw that in a couple situations here this summer. I didn't know the answer to it right away, so I put the picture out on Twitter and asked for some colleagues to chime in. And sure enough, they responded and said, um, they pointed me to a U of M publication where uh, we were recommending uh, that process for fertilizing trees. So uh, I've seen that. A lot of cases, that's the issue uh, they're dealing with. And be sure you consult with the homeowner and make sure that, in fact, uh, they have had a tree service come out there to fertilize their trees. If in this case they hadn't, we would still be trying, we would still be searching for the the cost. But um, I I don't know what else the cause would be in that case. We're kind of running a little bit low on time. I'm going to try to go through a scenario here, but I might just uh, just skip it, which is is certainly fine. I'll just skip it. I, I do have a step. Uh, making this ten or fifteen minutes or so, I suppose. But uh, a lot of the diseases that we see, uh, the occurrence can be based on temperature. So if you're experiencing a disease in your lawn, um, and that was the scenario that I had laid out there, you know, the first thing we started with in this scenario is early summer. It gives you an idea of what the temperatures are, and that's always the place that I like to start if I really suspect that the issue is a disease. Because if I determine what time that disease is occurring, I'm effectively eliminating at least 50% of the potential diseases that it could be. So you have cold weather diseases, you know, 32 to 45 degrees Fahrenheit, snow mold, snow mold, certainly water and ice damage from the winter. We also have what I would call these cool weather diseases, 45 to 60 degrees Fahrenheit, necrotic ring spot, fairy rings, uh, rust, red thread, powdery mildew, diseases that you might see uh, in, in cool weather. With the warmer weather, we're going to see more dollar spot, uh, some brown patch on occasion, and some leaf spots and then the necrotic ring spot as well. Very hot weather situations where we see, can we see rapid loss of, of turf uh, uh, of 75 degrees Fahrenheit. Pythium, uh, something that we see quite often in that situation, the summer pest, and then arachnosis as well can be another disease that we see on lawns in the heat of summer. We also obviously have disorders uh, that are not linked uh, with temperatures uh, as well. 
uh, high nitrogen diseases. So here's, you know, looking at the history of their fertilization applications can try to narrow down what uh, they might actually be encountering. Uh, we have five diseases that are very prevalent in high nitrogen situations. So if they put down a lot of fertilizer in the spring, summer, or fall, you might be seeing some of these. So brown patch, pythium, and the snow molds are all going to be encouraged by a, a fall fertilizer application, which is uh, certainly not something that we want uh, to, to encourage. And then all gray leaf spot as well. We also have a pretty good list of diseases that can be categorized as low nitrogen diseases. And oftentimes to try to grow out of some type of disease, you know, fertilization uh, application would be recommended. So dollar spot, summer patch, necrotic cream spot, uh, take all patch, red thread, and thracnose and rust would all be low nitrogen uh, type of diseases. Diagnosis for that case study that we just skipped over. Uh, step seven, so consult the diagnostic laboratory if you're really stumped and you can't figure out what the issue is. Um, our plant disease clinic uh, does certainly does lawn care samples. They have a very similar checklist to what I've included in one of those links as well. The link to the plant diagnostic clinic website is right here. Maybe Andrea can provide that as well for you in the chat box. It's just pdc.umn.edu. Uh, uh, they guarantee a callback within 24 hours upon uh, receiving that sample and try to give you at least an idea of, of what issue you might be experiencing. Be sure to follow instructions for proper sampling. Uh, their analysis and their results are only good as the sample that they, they get to analyze. And then you complete this submission form accurately. A lot of you know what you write on the submission form helps them to determine uh, what issue you might actually uh, be experiencing. And you know, in some cases, it, it does not come back as a, a disease that you're experiencing. But uh, the diagnostic lab is very good at determining whether it's an abiotic stress uh, type of pathogen or some type of insect that's affecting the turf. So uh, certainly a good option for you. Last thing I'll leave you with here is, uh, you know, just uh, be a good detective. So uh, be sure you're asking the right questions and uh, be sure you're asking uh, plenty of questions so you have enough information to try to actually figure out uh, what the uh, issue is. Don't believe everything that you hear over the phone. Homeowners' understandings of what the issue is they're experiencing uh, is not always accurate. Um, you know, oftentimes I, I hear that uh, the disease is urgently growing and um, and find out that it was never a disease that you're they're dealing with in the first place. A lot of homeowners think they have clay soils when in fact they don't. So um, just don't believe everything that you hear. Take it all, uh, you know, with a grain of salt until you actually observe the site for yourself. Understand that not every issue is a disease. In fact, most that we deal with are not. I suggest to look for soil or moisture issues to be the, the root the uh, no pun intended, of, of most of your problems. And there's only scientifically based resources for making recommendations. Try to stay off of the chat rooms and, um, and some of the, the company websites when you're making recommendations on how to control a particular issue that someone is experiencing in, in a law. So, okay, uh, that's kind of what I have, just some additional information here, uh, as well as some of our websites and uh, my contact information there as well. I think majority of you know how to get a hold of me and what websites we use. So I uh, hope everyone enjoyed that. At least it was probably, you know, a little bit informative for you of how I go through uh, diagnosing uh, turf disease issues, especially in lawns. I think we have some time here if we want to take any questions. Uh, group. Sam, that was really great information. And if you have a question, someone's already submitted. Okay. I have a circular witch's broom effect in the lawn grass. I have also have a ton of ants. Uh, would they be the vector for this, or should I look for some other cause? The ants are ants are just you know, nuisance. So they're they really not feeding on turf. They're not going to damage the turf. The only way ants actually damage turf is from the month that they create. It's not feeding on turf at all. If you have a circular patch of a witch's broom. Other cases I would suspect that would probably be a different species of grass. And the two that come to my mind would be either being bent grass or rough bluegrass that tend to form circular patches and really kind of lay down and take a rip over them. You know, will come up, you know, they, they'll kind of pull up in, in, in 
a little bit of a clump because they're uh, stolen if they have uh, uh, stolen that creep across the ground. So that would be my first suspicion. Yeah, you know, in your grass, they're coming in your house probably. They are in the yard anyway. <laughs> yeah, for sure, right, right. Uh, so anyone else have a question? Go ahead and type that in. So we'll get a little bit of time. Those links, those are uh, some pretty links. Go ahead and print off the checklist and the questionnaires even, uh, and, and try to use those when you conduct your site visits. Those can be a very, very important step in the process. And then, yes, this is recorded. Okay. Is there an evaluation associated with this, or? Yeah. So at the end of the webinar, a window will pop up and okay. it has a Qualtrics survey. Sure. Okay. Nice. Well, if you have any other questions, I appreciate everybody for joining here. Uh, I don't see any more? Just some comments. Presentation. Thank you. Um, if they have a copy of the presentation, feel free to email me as well. I'm happy to send that out. I'll get one more question in. Okay. Uh, down some grub killer now for Japanese beetles. We're getting really close to timing. Yep. Yeah, now's the time. I'll see if we say the first first week or uh, uh, of is yep. So you're getting really close. I think you can go ahead and put it down this weekend. The website, I don't know if I can type it in the chat here if everybody can see this when I type it in. It's called uh, G GD dot net. Uh, there's a question there. So GDD net. That's a website that's run by uh, Michigan State University and does growing degree days, uh, growing degree day calculators for when to put down your pre emergent applications for crabgrass, when to approve preventative Japanese beetle applications as well. So that can be a very useful tool. There are more questions then, but again, comments, trick information and presentation. So if you don't come up with a question later, send that to Sam. And um, otherwise, thank you all for joining us this afternoon and being patient with us with the technology. And we'll see you next week. Oh, thanks. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Andrea. Thanks.